a co-founder of the Cheyenne River Grassroots Collective, to come share some of her knowledge and some of her words and experience. She is in South Dakota right now, along with our communities, fighting on the front lines against Keystone XL Pipeline. Not only that, but fighting the many man camps who exact violence against our women and our communities. So she is here as a warrior with the whole delegation. And I'd like to go ahead and invite her up now. Yeah. Hello, my relatives. My name is uh, Tashina, and it's translated into Black Shawl Woman. I am from the Cheyenne River Street Reservation. This is my son, Kia. Uh, and I am a co-founder of the Cheyenne River Grassroots Collective. I'm also a community organizer with them as well. Uh, I think we can all agree that the last four years have been utter bullshit. And because of this, we are here now to speak to the DNC and call out Biden to stick to his four policy plan for racial, equi or racial equity, uh, climate justice, public health, and uh, economic prosperity. So part of what we do with the Cheyenne River Grassroots Collective is we monitor the workflow of TC Energy's Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, right now we have boots on the ground who have been uh, checking out the work camps, or all better known as man camps, where thousands of construction workers from out of state will be flocking there to earn a buck. Now these man camps, uh, when we've been documenting, they are not uh, following CDC recommendations. They don't wear masks and that bring, poses a threat to our community. Our indigenous communities uh, on Cheyenne River, we barely have the manpower or in the resources to tackle COVID. So that's one of our biggest concerns too, along with the missing and murdered indigenous rate, our indigenous people's rate, uh, when that skyrocketed when these man camps are put near reservation borders. Um, so we also empower our communities to get organized and to start fighting back about these injustices that have been happening to our people for over 500 years now. We are a strong, resilient nation on Cheyenne River, and we know that they, it is a strategy and a tactic that they're using to be there right by our borders. All along the case, Keystone XL pipeline route, there's little to no activity except by Cheyenne River. There are now four man camps there. And it, it breaks my heart every day to watch it happen, watch them uh, already dig up the earth and try to go under our rivers and waterways. Uh, so what scares me the most about this though, is that we were given information by a credible source that will remain anonymous, that an unclassified document uh, written by the national or the South Dakota National Guard. And it, in there, it provides personnel and equipment and it's, uh, to assist the county and state elected in its elected official response to the TC Energy Pipeline construction. Within that document, they have already made a plan to use lethal force. We've read this document. We, we, and it, it's terrifying because we are, as the Cheyenne River Oyate, we do everything in our power to try to protect our people, to try to protect our children's future, to try to protect the earth, the water, the land, the air. It runs in our blood. It's our resilience that has been keeping us alive. It is us being out in the streets every day or out the pipelines every day to make sure that we can still thrive so that we can still grow as a nation. We always ask ourselves, what kind of ancestor do we want to be for our descendants? And I want to be like Crazy Horse who fought and died for his people, who fought and died to protect what little we have left here now. So I'm going to ask AOC, I'm going to ask the Democratic National Commu uh, Committee, I'm going to ask Biden, please put an end to this fossil fuel addiction, put an end to this ongoing genocide, put an end to the ongoing injustices against our people, because we will stand. And we do know that there are people willing to put their bodies on the line to make sure that our future generations will have a clean, beautiful, uh, and, and just 
thriving communities. And I want to say Wopi Latanka to all of you who are here today to make sure that our frontline voices are being heard because we're running out of time and we need Biden to stop it now. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, I also am going to introduce uh, Margaret with the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. So give it up for Margaret. Hi, all. Thank you for that. Hi, my name is Margaret Quatin. Um, I'm with the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. I'm the Green New Deal National Organizer there. And I thought I'd start us off with a little bit of a call and response. So I'm going to say care jobs are, and what I want you to say is green jobs. So I'm going to say care jobs are. Care jobs are? Green jobs. Care jobs are? Green jobs. Care jobs are? Green jobs. All right. So I feel like I could do that all day. Um, so what I'm going to talk a little bit about is, one, uh, the context that we're in, two, the type of transformation that we need, knowing that we are building the power to make that happen. So I think as so many folks have already said, we are at the crossroads of many intersecting crises that have only been exacerbated by this pandemic. So thinking about structural racism, thinking about the economy and unemployment, the COVID crisis has only made these things worse. And at the root of many of these crises is actually the need uh, to prioritize profit over people. So when we're thinking about why the COVID crisis got so bad, we can point directly to the desire to have businesses make profit and to stay open rather than uh, spending the money and the time to support people with resources to stay safe. That same logic has been what has exacerbated the climate crisis, the desire to continue to fuel extraction, overprotecting life and protecting our communities. So given that this is the point we're at, I think the question is, what has been made more clear in this moment and how are we going to respond to it? And one of the things that's been made more clear in this moment is who is really at the heart of our economy that makes it function. These are our essential workers. These are our teachers, our domestic workers, our workers in the care economy that are caring for our loved ones, for the elders, for our children, for our disabled brothers and sisters. It is so incredibly important that we are lifting up those folks as we march on to a new economy. So to continue on what the solution is, it's, it's us investing in both, uh, in both an economy that cares for the planet, in green union jobs uh, that are going to prioritize clean water and clean air, while also investing in green jobs that are care jobs, that are caring for our families. And we think that the Green New Deal and the Thrive Agenda is able to put a down payment on the type of economy that we need, a type of economy that centers life over profit, a, a type of economy that is anti-racist in nature, that is prioritizing communities of color and rectifying past harms done, a, an economy that is feminist in nature, that is recognizing the unpaid, unseen work that so many women and femmes are doing in their homes every day, and an economy that is regenerative, one that is uh, investing in renewable energy and also a new form of agriculture that is not, doesn't have the same, wreak the same havoc on our earth. So that's why we're here today, is that we're demanding that you know, Biden be brave, that he step up to the plate, because we have the solutions in our communities. We know that this work is important and that it's gonna be incredibly important in whatever new economy that we build. And so we're saying this, the, the Green New Deal and the Thrive Agenda are, are part of making a down payment on the, the type of world that we need, an economy where we're centering life, where we're choosing to thrive. Thank you. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, introduce John Henry with the Sunrise Movement. Thank you so much. Um, like you said, I'm an organizer with the Sunrise Movement, a regional organizer, and I'm here to tell you a story. In 2008, my father, a man who would walk around the house singing civil rights songs and who had dog bites on his arms and who went to work every day, died of a major coronary while walking my mother home from her job as a waitress. And the nurse who stopped on the side of the road to give him CPR was probably some of the only health care he received in the later years of his life. And I had a choice at that moment 
Was I going to give up or was I going to get up? And I got up. And I helped my mom file the tax returns so we could afford to bury my father. I helped find his military paperwork so we could bury him in a national cemetery. I planned the funeral. And I remember my twin looking me in the eye and saying, John, you haven't cried. Why haven't you cried? And I stared back at him and I said, because there is work to do. In 2019, a decade later, I was working three jobs in Los Angeles and still not having enough to pay rent. I was cursing the fires that were burning from the Amazon to Los Angeles, and I was driving to my friend's mansions, meanwhile passing tent camps of homeless people on the streets. And I was sick of going back and forth to work pretending like everything was normal, knowing I was living in a society where my political leaders had failed me. And again, I had the decision, was I going to get up or was I going to give up? And I got up and I threw my stuff in my car and I drove across the country here to Washington, D.C., where I joined the Sunrise Movement. And in 2020, in the middle of a global pandemic, while the police continue to kill black people in this country, and hurricane after hurricane is battering our country, we have the decision, are we gonna get up or are we gonna give up? And I am part of a generation of black, indigenous, Latinx people of color who are getting up, who rose by the millions to help get Joe Biden elected and who helped get these Green New Deal champions we are going to hear from in a minute elected. People who took to the streets. And we are asking you to stand by your promise to us. And I want to use Barack Obama's words. It is time to pick ourselves up, shake ourselves off, and begin the work of rebuilding America. But this time, let's build it for black people. Let's build it for indigenous people. Let's build it for youth. Let's build it for justice and not build it for money. Let's build it alongside the organizers and my friends gathered here. Two years ago, we stood here as the Sunrise Movement and we asked Nancy Pelosi to form a Green New Deal committee. Today, we are asking President-elect Joe Biden to form a select office on climate mobilization. Treat this crisis with the urgency it deserves. Treat it with the urgency of a mother in Lake Charles who is homeless for the second time this year, with the urgency of the California farm workers working under soot, blood red filled skies, and treat it with the urgency of the middle schoolers who made millions of calls to get you elected. If you do that, we will never forget you. And if you fail us, we will never forgive you. Thank you guys, and I, it is my immense honor to bring an activist and Congresswoman-elect Cori Bush here to speak with us. So, yes, yeah, so thank you all for welcoming me. Thank you for inviting me to this moment. So, first of all, I think that we need to make sure that something is very clear. When we don't act, people who look like me die. So let me say that again. When people don't act, people who look like me die. And so there is just no other alternative right now than to make sure that we have bold leadership. And some people say, oh, well, you can't win or you can't, you have to play this game. Well, I'm done with the games. We can't play any more games because when we play the games, people die. What we're looking at right now, when we cross the mark, for 250,000 people dying at the hands of Trump's COVID-19, and I'm calling it Trump's COVID-19 because this could have been done differently. So we're looking right now to President-elect Joe Biden to make some changes and do some things that are different, but it's not good enough to just do different. We got to do bold. We got to do change that happens now. We got to make sure that black folks, brown folks, every marginalized group, our indigenous folks feel our change. And so that's why we're here. We need change that everybody can feel. And so, yes, we're going to get in good trouble doing it. Yes, we're going to make sure that we say the names of those that have passed.
because of, of failed leadership. And so that's what we're asking for right now. When I think about the day when I didn't care about the climate, and see, one thing you all know about me is I tell my own ish. I don't need somebody to tell it for me. There was a day when I didn't care about the climate. I thought the climate crisis and climate issues was all about, or, or caring about the environment was about recycling and, and, and endangered, endangered animals. Well, I tell you what, I found out after fighting about why is my energy bill so high? fighting about why do I keep having to go to the hospital for asthma? Why does my child have to keep going to the hospital for asthma? And then I realized that it's these coal companies and it's these, it's these companies that are the ones that are pushing this into our communities, into communities that have nothing to do with it, that are the most impacted who look like me. When I think about my district where black children are 10 times as likely to go to the ER for asthma than white children, we got to do something about it. So we're calling on the Biden administration right now to save lives. Save lives. There's no other alternative. We need bold leadership, and we're asking you because we voted for you. Black and brown communities showed up. Ilhan Omar and our sister right here, Rashida Tlaib, showed up and made sure that people were out showing up to vote. So we're asking you to show up for us, and we need it now. Thank you. How y'all doing? Such a pleasure and honor to be here with you all. Very humbling to be standing amongst you as a congressman elect representing New York's 16th district. You know, our first evening here, Majority Leader Steny Hoyer took us on a tour of the Capitol and took us into what we often refer to as the People's House. But I couldn't help but feel a certain sense of anger and frustration and guilt because I didn't feel the people's house was representative of the indigenous people of this country. I didn't feel the people's house really captured how African slaves built this country with their hands for 244 years and haven't earned a dime as a result of that work. The People's House didn't capture that for me. And as I stand here amongst you and we talk about the need for climate justice and pushing back against environmental racism, I dream along with my sisters and my new friends and family members in Congress, I dream of the rebirth of America. And I dream of a country that we are going to rebuild together that is representative of all of us and all of the people of this country, not just white men at the top harnessing and exercising power and continuing to fund the fossil fuel industry, which is literally destroying the planet and killing us. I dream of a world and I, I, I can't wait to get to work in building a country and building a planet that really represents all of us and works for all of us. So in my district, in my district in New York 16, it's a majority minority district. And part of that district represents the Bronx along with my sister, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. And if you live in the Bronx, you are three times more likely to die of asthma than anywhere else in the country. My district is also surrounded by water. We have the Henry Hudson on one side and the Long Island Sound on another. And right now in Yonkers, which is part of my district, we have raw sewage leaking into the Henry Hudson on a daily basis. On the other side of the district in Mount Vernon, we have raw sewage leaking in to the Long Island Sound, which is going upstream into AOC's district. So this is an urgent matter that we have to deal with. We are living in a climate catastrophe. It is impacting my district like districts across the, across the country. And I want to add this very important point. After World War II, after the Great Depression, we implemented something called the New Deal. And the New Deal built not just a white middle class, but it built white wealth in this country. 
$120 billion invested over a 30-year period to build white wealth. 98% of those loans went to white people. African Americans were excluded. The Latino communities were excluded. Indigenous communities were excluded. Joe Biden has pledged a $2 trillion investment in environmental justice. And 40% of that has been pledged to districts like mine across the country. So that 40% has to be a part of a Green New Deal that rebuilds black and brown communities across this country. In parts of my district, we have pockets where the poverty rate is as high as 30%. We need jobs, we need infrastructure, and we need those jobs to go to black and brown communities. Black and brown communities organize across the country to make sure J Joe Biden won the White House. And he did that. But now it's time for payback. And now it's time to make sure that we invest the resources necessary to rebuild our nation in a way that is representative of all of us so we can truly have the people's house. Thank you so much. God bless you all. It is difficult to go after my brother, the Congressman-elect Jamal Bowman. Who would have thought prior to this year that in 2020, Westchester County would be represented by not one, but two black progressive members of the United States Congress. And the fact is, this progressive movement has been defying expectations every single day. It is a joy and an honor to be standing alongside movement leaders, organizations like Sunrise and the Green New Deal Network, members of Congress for whom I have tremendous respect, and yes, soon to be members of Congress like the amazing Cori Bush and Jamal Bowman. <laughs> Climate change is happening all around us. Fires have been burning up the west coast of the United States of America. Droughts increasingly, increasingly have been leading to food and water insecurity. Hurricanes are proliferating, and they're not just devastating the Gulf Coast where we're used to seeing that. They're devastating communities like my home county of Rockland, New York, where Hurricane Isaiah plunged 100,000 households into darkness. Climate change is real, and for the first time in our lifetimes, we have the opportunity with a Biden-Harris administration to avoid and avert climate catastrophe and ensure a livable future, not just for ourselves, but for our children and our children's children. And that is thanks to the work that we have been doing for a long time. I am excited to build back better and to pass the most robust, ambitious climate proposal offered by any major party nominee for the presidency of the United States of America. We've got to fight like our lives depend on it because they do. We've only got 10 years left on the clock before irreparable damage to the planet. And so we can't afford to change the margins, we got to make sure we undertake the big structural work globally to make sure that we have a planet that we can inhabit a few years from today. I'm excited to roll up my sleeves with all the folks behind me and with all of you in front of me by my side to continue that important long suffering work. And my goodness, don't the folks in Congress of good conscience now having reinforcements. I'm excited to be joining the most progressive and most diverse Congress in American history, the 117th Congress. 
I'm excited to work with a president elect and a vice president elect who have centered environmental injustice, or rather have centered environmental justice as racial justice. I heard Congressman elect Jamal Bowman talk about his district and we are discovering and experiencing many of the same challenges just north of his district in central and northern Westchester and all of Rockland and of course all throughout the United States of America. I'm excited to work with you all. I'm excited to fight alongside you and we will win this fight. Thank you. Incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear it for Cori Bush who started us off, brought the house down. Let's hear it. The pride of New York right now, Mondaire Jones and Jamal Bowman. Let's hear it for people who have been in this fight, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, and, and to the man who really helped and partnered in, in making sure that we start this whole thing off, Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts, along with all of our other partners fighting for a Green New Deal. You know, it's, um, it's, it's really emotional. I found myself getting emotional hearing Corey and Jamal and Mondaire Mondaire actually represents um, the district where I went to elementary school. He represents the district where I, I grew up in public school. And um, it's really, it's so emotional to hear him talk and champion these issues because growing up as a little girl, I never, ever saw any elected representation that even really thought of me, let alone looked anything remotely like me. And to think that we could fast forward and we have champions like Mondaire Jones and Jamal Bowman and, and Corey Bush that are now being ushered into this wave. It shows that these issues are not a fluke. It shows that they are not a flash in the pan. It shows that they are not a hot new thing. What it shows is a deep yearning for climate justice and environmental action in the United States of America. It shows a deep commitment to climate change. It shows that this isn't 2015 anymore. This isn't 2010 anymore. It's not 2005 anymore. Climate is now a top three issue for voters across the country. And it's about time that our Congress and our administration starts acting like it. It's way past time. But what I think is so important is that every single person up here represents the power of the movement. It represents the power of indigenous communities organizing, the power of young people organizing, the power of the movement for black lives organizing, showing that climate is intersectional with every one of our needs and demands. It is tied to the treaty rights and liberties of indigenous peoples in the United States of America. Climate action is tied to reproductive justice. We can't talk about poison water without talking about how so many people across their country, across this country, are denied the right to build a biological family because they've been poisoned by their own water. We can't talk about climate unless we're talking about the rights of young people to have a habitable planet, unless we're talking about the rights of working class people to have a job that, that guarantees them dignity. And it's only bold federal action that can guarantee these things. It is only that kind of transformational investment. Now we have worked and the movement has pushed. The movement is why I was elected to Congress. The movement is why Jamal and Corey and Mondaire are here today. You all, the movement is why Ilhan is here. The movement is why Rashida is here. The movement is why Ed Markey was protected this year. It was the movement. Because as we've been saying since day one, they've got money, but we've got people. We've got people. And at the end of the day, dollar bills don't vote, although they try to. We vote. People vote. Young people vote. And it's about time, long past time, that we recognize and understand that we owe our seats, we owe our, our political power because of young people, because of the movement for black lives, because of women, because of the working class across this country. And it's, it's a class issue, it's a race issue, it's a gender issue. 
That's why this work is so important. And because of the movement and the power that the movement has built, over a million calls were made in Texas alone. Over a million calls. We had calls made for, Jamal, you know how many calls were made for you in your race? Yes. How many? Sunrise overall. Yeah. Sun, 1.2 million overall, 865,000 by sunrise. There you go. The movement made a million calls for Jamal Bowman. So don't tell us about what young people can and can't do what the movement for black lives can and can't do, what the movement for climate justice can and can't do. And because you all have done the work, you all got us a seat at the table. We have worked with the Biden administration to secure commitment on a $2 trillion climate plan. $2 trillion. But we're not gonna stop there. We're not gonna stop with a piece of paper. That's not what's gonna happen. We're not gonna forget about that agreement for the sake of an election, are we? No, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna organize and demand that this administration, which I believe is decent and kind and honorable, keep their promise. So that's what, that's what our next move is, is to make sure that the Biden administration keeps its promise, kept its promise to young people, kept its promise to the movement for black lives, kept its promise to communities and working class people across the United States of America. That's our message today, to keep your promise. And so we know that we don't just make that demand and walk away. We have to organize for it. We have to bring the heat for it because there's a whole lot of people that tried to just shove a bunch of money before this election to try to buy their seat at the table. But we organize for ours and we're not easily going to let that go. So our demand here is to make sure that we keep this promise, that we follow through on a visionary, absolutely unprecedented $2 trillion plan that's not just about money, but also it's one of the first presidential plans to honor the treaty rights of native people. They're one of the first rights to make sure that we have environmental justice front and center. So we that we make sure that we make up for redlining, that we make up for Flint, that we make up for Baltimore, that we make up for lead in the pipes across this country. So that's what this movement is all about. I want to thank you. And I don't want anybody here to think that we're not winning. Because let me tell you something, we're winning. It's working. It's happening. And we are going to secure a future. We're going to secure the basic tenets of a Green New Deal a multi-trillion dollar jobs program for climate, for environmental, racial, gender, and class justice. That's what the Green New Deal is, and we will stick to that plan. So thank you all so very much. And I hand it off to Rashida. Hey, everyone. I don't care. I think we look really good, including you, Senator Markey. Um, we not only look good, but we speak truth to power. And I'll tell you, you know, Sister ALC said it, you know, we're, we're already one. You know why? Because they can't get rid of us. We're everywhere. It's true. I swear to God, every time I turn around, some of my colleagues come up to me and said, can you talk to those sun people? I said, you mean sunrise? I was like, that movement is not going anywhere. You went through a generation of a movement, folks, maybe anti-war, civil rights, labor rights movement. You remember Senator Berkey? This is a movement of people. We're not going anywhere. But let me tell you what's incredibly important here is that, you know, as you all see up here, it's going to be our lived experiences that really have us be able to get credibility within the uh, halls of Congress. And in my district where I grew up in southwest Detroit, I honestly thought that smell was normal. I honestly thought that my friends having asthma was normal because they normalized it. But we're here to tell them that's not normal. That is not normal to watch people have to put a respiratory machine on their six-year-old child because she can't breathe because the corporate, but the pollution is so bad. I have family members that call me all the time and tell me, what are we doing here? We're giving them the permission to kill us, permission to pollute. And when I look and talk to our young kids, and when I'm always reading them books and everything, I always ask them at the end, how many of you all have asthma? And a third of them, a third of them raise their hands. They're living with so much pollution. Some of them can't even go to their fountains covered in plastic because there's so much lead in the water coming into their schools. So it's important as we talk about this movement, as you see us all up here, that we put the human face, 
to what it means to do nothing about our climate crisis, what it means to do nothing about dirty air and dirty water. And so I ask all of you to continue this movement to give credibility to us. Because when they decide to do nothing, when they decide maybe this is not the moment, I want you all to show them, show them with the images. If it's an indigenous brothers and sisters, it's those suffering from whatever's happening globally and the migration that's coming in our country, understanding all of it's interconnected. But I'll tell you, when I met with President-elect Biden in Detroit, he said, you know, I'm gonna need your help. I said, sir, I'm gonna help you get reelected. Don't worry about that. Because the people are going to come out because they know the importance of protecting our country and our democracy. But I said, you, I might not be your favorite member of Congress because my timeline is different. My timeline is different. I have no time to, if our folks don't have another day, another hour, another, any moment, another week, a month, they're tired of waiting. They've asked you for clean air. They have asked you for clean water to protect them. And so we're on a different timeline and we're gonna make sure that the Biden administration sticks to our timeline, is moving towards our timeline. And so I ask all of you, do not move from the needle, do not. We are more than them. And let me tell you, as we beat the drum as loud as we're gonna get, and it's gonna continue to beat, we understand this movement is more than one day. It is more than election day. This movement is more than ever in the election day. It is about people and about transformational, meaningful action around climate crisis. Thank you on behalf of my seniors, my residents. They know I'm a crier, but you all know, representing the third poorest congressional district, my residents can't come up here. They can't afford it. They can't afford to leave their homes. So you young people, I want you to know this. You are speaking on behalf of so many people in my district that need your voices here. I will bring them into the halls of Congress, into committee, but you all being here is inspiring them. They love that you are speaking the truth about the injustice that they've had to live with so for so long. So thank you for that. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm excited to see all of you. I know everybody has talked about what this movement has meant. And for me, I've been really excited because I represent a district that has just had 88% turnout this election cycle. And I know that there was a massive increase in Rashida's and there's been massive increases in districts where for generations people have tried to get people to come out and participate in our democracy. And for the last week and a half, everyone has asked me what happened in your district, Ilhan? What do you think is the reason so many people came out and participated in this election? And for me, it's very simple. It's about the invitation we put out to people and why they needed to participate. Because the invitation was about electing someone who was going to invest in building our country back better. And so as soon as the election was over and we've seen all of these people who participated because of that invitation, we have seen the pundits and some of the leaders within the Democratic Party or even some of our colleagues who are um, freshmen talk about us getting back to basics. Saying, you know, the squad, Alex, Ilhan, Rashida, all of you have to stop talking about everything you talk about because we need to get back to basics. So I was confused because I thought, what is more basic than fighting for clean water? What is more basic than fighting for a breathable planet? What is more basic than trying to make sure we get health care for people? What is more basic than fighting for the people you represent, knowing that you represent districts where there are pockets, where the children in that community have the third highest asthma rate? What is more basic than fighting to make sure that here in the United States, black women should not die 
of maternal mortality rate four times higher than their white female counterparts. Right. What is more basic than trying to make sure that there is transportation and transit and that there is sustainable communities and making sure that we are inviting people to set the agenda instead of corporations and special interests. What is more basic than trying to make sure our indigenous brothers and sisters don't use, don't lose their sovereignty and, and that we fight to stop things like the, um, the pipeline in, in Minnesota and trying to make sure that we are not prioritizing the fossil fuel industry. What is more basic than trying to protect the future of our children? So people will talk about kitchen table issues and everything that we fight for to me is what my family discusses at the kitchen table. That is what your family discusses at the kitchen table. This is why this movement is so exciting because we know that a Green New Deal is not just some platitude, it's not just some conversation that's cooked up in the basement of some corporation. This is a conversation, a movement that's built out of the urgency that people feel in wanting to protect our climate and our planet. So as a daughter of a 17 year old who is part of this movement, who got excited at the age of 14 because she realized that that 10 year mark meant that her eight year old sister might not have a future to look forward to when she graduates high school. So as Rashida says, we are walking off a different timeline. The urgency we feel is very different than the people who turn a blind eye to the ticking time bomb of this climate crisis. And so I urge you all to continue raising this issue because we hear you, we are here with you, and we stand by you. And every single day that we spend in Congress will be a day devoted to this movement and the things that we are fighting for to have a better future for tomorrow. Thank you, uh, Representative Omar. Thank you to all of you for your passion and persistence. Thanks to you, we have all these amazing new members who are going to fight for climate change. We've got a senator elected with a mandate on climate change. And, you know, I remember when this was just starting and Representative Ocasio-Cortez had the boldness to meet with the Sunrise Movement and all of you, uh, and you stayed with it for two years outside the DNC when we didn't have a climate change debate. Boy, were they wrong. Boy, were they wrong not to do that. And we see now that young people mobilized around the climate, but it was not just an issue of a livable planet and not just an issue of justice, it's an issue of jobs. And I think we have to make very clearly the argument that a climate policy is a policy that's good for the economy. The fastest growing jobs, the fastest growing jobs in the country are solar panel installers and wind technicians and energy efficiency manufacturers. And you know where these jobs are? These jobs just aren't in California or New York or Massachusetts. Turns out these jobs are in Ohio and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan. And so when they say that the environment or the Green New Deal is an anti-economic policy, they don't know what they're talking about. The Green New Deal and what we're fighting for is a policy to put the working class back to work, to create good paying jobs, to create jobs in the parts of the country that need those jobs the most. We have the facts on our side. We have the argument on the, our side. They have the rhetoric on their side. They have the sloganeering on their side. And the only thing that will beat sloganeering, the only thing that will beat rhetoric is all of you. Because when you go out 
and you're armed with the facts. And young people have the most facts that I know. I saw this with the Parkland kids. You know all the statistics. You have all the evidence. And if you mobilize and you demand that we have an office of climate mobilization and you demand that we have a climate policy as an economic policy, then I know in this administration we're going to get it done and actually make progress to tackling climate change. Thank you for being out here. Thank you, Ro. Um, so thank you all for being here today. Uh, we are no longer in the era of incrementalism. We are in an era where fundamental change must take place if we are going to save our planet. When Alexandria and I introduced the Green New Deal in February of 2019, it was called pie in the sky. It was called politically infeasible. It was called unrealistic. And then we had an election in 2020. And the Sunrise Movement rose up and injected itself into race after race across our country. And reinforcements are now arriving in Congress. Corey and Jamal and Mondaire all represent this revolution changing the way in which people see the issue of climate change in our lives. And this isn't a matter of moving to the left. It's a matter of doing what's right. That is what happened. That is what people saw over the last two years. Young people rose up and young people voted in unprecedentedly high numbers. And their number one issue was the climate crisis. Alexandria talked about my race. In 2018 in Massachusetts, 18 to 34 year olds represented 12% of the total vote. In 2020, it represented 19% of the total vote. And their number one issue was the climate crisis. And so there's an IOU. There's a, there's a debt now to these young people because they did rise up. They did the right thing. They played by the rules. And what they know is that the planet is dangerously warming and there are no emergency rooms for planets. And I also know that we can solve this problem by massive deployment of wind and solar and all electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids and battery storage technologies and energy efficiency and energy conservation technologies. And we can create millions of new jobs. We can save all of creation by engaging in massive job creation. That is what we are going to do. And we know, and we know that in the Biden plan, a $2 trillion plan, that 40% of the funding is going to be designated for communities of color. That 40% of the money is going to be dealing with the obvious reality that black and brown communities have always breathed different air than white suburban communities in the United States of America. And we can see that in the coronavirus crisis where black and brown communities close to the pollution have the highest levels of coronavirus as well because they're both respiratory illnesses. We can see that. And so we're at a moment right now where the fossil fuel industry is descending on Washington, D.C. And they want to call the Green New Deal socialism. And you know what our answer is? What do you call 100 years of tax breaks for the oil and the gas and the coal industry? And what we're saying is 
Give us the same brakes for wind and solar and all electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids and battery storage technologies, and we will bury the fossil fuel industry. That is what this fight is all about. We are going to take them on every single day. We are going to make sure that those young people, those sunrise organizers, realize this political payback that they have fought for. And so for me, uh, this is the moment. And these new, incredibly great leaders are coming over the hill as the reinforcements because there has been not just a moment, but a movement that has changed our country. And it's going to continue to change our country. So we're just here to say that we want and we ask Joe Biden to be brave, to be big, to be bold, to ensure that we put in place the kinds of policies that are going to fundamentally transform the relationship which exists between the people of our country and this climate, and that we do so with intersectionality. We do so with communities of color at the front of the line. We do so recognizing the historic injustices and that we take what was considered to be a pie-in-the-sky proposal, the Green New Deal that Alexandria and I introduced two years ago, which does not seem so crazy any longer because it will create the jobs that we need and it will provide the justice that our country has been desperate to have for generations. Thank you all so much for being here. We, we are going to have just a few minutes of Q&A after our song. Awesome. We're about to sing a song called We Are Standing For Our Futures. If you know the song, sing along. If you don't know it, listen and then sing in when you figure it out. All right. We are standing for our futures. We are healing what is wrong. We are standing for our futures and together we are strong. We are standing for our futures. We are healing what is wrong. We are standing for our futures and together we are Everyone! Strong. We are standing for our futures. We are healing what is wrong. We are standing for our futures and together we are strong. We are standing for our futures. We are healing what is wrong. We are standing for our futures and together we One are One more time. Strong. We are standing for our futures. We are healing what is wrong. We are standing for our futures and together we are strong. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to take a couple of questions now. Right here. Well, you know, I'm not concerned about the president trying to derail uh, progress for the grassroots movement. I am concerned about the fossil fuel industry trying to derail progress for our movement. I'm concerned about ExxonMobil trying to derail progress for our movement. But, you know, when we first introduced, as, as Senator Markey said, when we first introduced uh, the Green New Deal at the beginning of, of this most recent term, we were told everything from it's unreasonable to it is beyond the pale, that, um, that these provisions are, are unrealistic. But now you fast forward to the end of this term, and they told us we couldn't repeal fair cloth in the House, and we did. They told us we couldn't get past X amount of, of sponsors, co-sponsors on this legislation. We are now past 100 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives on the Green New Deal resolution. They told us that we couldn't get union support. We, they told us we couldn't get union support from building trades on climate action, and lo and behold, we have union support on the Green New Deal for public housing to massively invest in infrastructure in this country. So there's a lot of people on both sides of the party, a lot of Democrats saying we can't do what we've already done. There are a lot of people that are saying that it is not possible. So again, I'm not concerned about this president's commitment. I am concerned about the voices and the industries and the lobbyists that could infiltrate 
and, and really kind of poison the ability for us to have progress, which is why we have to con convene and keep the pressure on. Thank you. President-elect Biden has constructed a $2 trillion infrastructure program that is green. And he asked for the Sunrise Movement to be a part of the construction of that plan. And it is the boldest plan that any presidential candidate has ever put in place. And so from our perspective, we are ready to fight in order to make sure that that plan becomes reality and that the fuel economy standards which donald trump has rolled back are put in place that the appliance efficiency standards which donald trump has rolled back are put back in place and expanded and made even bolder and and i i know that when joe biden talks about this is, these issues he says that he is committed to rolling back all the trump environmental uh policies uh, in moving forward and moving forward boldly, okay? And so that's what we are doing. We are, we are here to say that we are uh, committed to ensuring that the boldest policies are put in place. Uh, and we are very hopeful uh, that with our efforts and the momentum that we have created, that that will be the case next year uh, in the Biden administration. Right here. A couple questions there. <laughs> um, yes, you know, I I, um, I had the the privilege of serving on the Climate Unity Task Force uh, with with the Biden team, and you know, to your first question on transition, there is open communication uh, between I I think uh, just many parts of the party, including the progressive wing of the party, um, and you know, I think in terms of what we're going to see on the seriousness of a Biden-Harris administration on climate are uh, their appointments uh, and are in their transition. So, you know, it's not just about one figure or one person, but we need to see the uh, a broader level um, in the overall tenor of transition appointments, because we know that in transportation is a climate issue. We know health and human services is a climate issue. So we want to see in every cabinet appointment if what the disposition towards climate is and how the, how uh, the Biden Harris administration wants to approach climate uh, and, and who they put in. So I think it's a, it's really the amalgam. It's the orchestra and the harmony of those appointments to understand um, how serious the administration is. Thank you. Right here. I do this again. Sorry. Um, you know, I think where hope is is that if you're, if you're, and I say this as an activist as well, if you're only looking at electoral politics, you will get cynical and upset and turn away and just want to fold and give up. So my advice to you is to not rely on electoral politics. We need to have, and that's why we operate as, um, as, as in an inside-outside strategy. 
That's why you all send us in there to have all of these very frustrating, um, you know, type of, of struggles. While you all keep keep doing the the hopeful work of organizing, and you know, if you want to know about whether it's fracking or any other issue, just look at the movement that emerged at Standing Rock. Look at the movements that emerged around Flint. Look at the movements that emerged in, in our home state of New York, where, where grassroots movements successfully um, uh, attained a moratorium and then a ban uh, on fracking. And so you all don't forget the power that you have and do not think that we have to rely solely on elected officials for change. We are partners in this. We are not above or below at each other in this. And can you give your name and outlet? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I just, I don't, I don't think this is a form of protest. It's building public support, and this is something that I think is so important. I hope we win the two Georgia races, but if we don't, the House should pass bold policies, and we should have the administration mobilize around the country for those bold policies. That is the uh, aspiration what the American people want. We shouldn't be compromising with ourselves uh, or with McConnell. So when you see a movement outside the DNC, we're all part of the DNC. We're not protesting ourselves. What we're saying is this is what the Democratic Party wants. This, it's not opinion. It's fact. I mean, Fox News has polls out there showing overwhelming support for Medicare for all, overwhelming support for the Green New Deal. It's only in Washington that these policies are considered difficult. So this is saying this is what the Democratic Party believes. And we as much to the Democratic Party mantle and, and articulating those views as any other uh, elected person. Right here. And I think this is gonna be the last question and we do have movement leaders who are gonna be interviewed right around the corner over here and would love for folks to direct questions there after we wrap up here. Uh, no, no, that's not that's not a concern of mine, and uh, and I, I can't speak for the other members of Congress. Um, what you know, we are all members of Congress. We represent different districts. We are all here as part of um, uh, as part of our caucus to bring forth um, the the policies that that we are advocating for and care for. Uh, the ones that the people who have elected us sent us to prioritize. Not every single district shares a priority. Um, and so our job is to introduce the pieces of legislation, get people to co-sign those pieces of legislation and try to work um, to, to move them through, through that process and make the demands of, of the speaker and leadership um, to implement the, the policies that, that, that we want. Um, and you know it's a it's a push and pull like it is with everything else uh, and you know we're not oblivious to that we're not naive on, on the way that this this process works um, we've had many successes in in this last Congress uh, in ways in that we have pushed uh, the speaker to implement changes in uh, some of the key pieces of legislation that came out of our, our um, caucus and we intend to continue to do that as progressive uh, caucus members all right, thank you all so much. As I said, for, there are gonna be movement leaders over here. For us, this is about being fundamentally unyielding in what we need, which is liberation for our people and our communities and a future that is livable. So yes, we do need to see these outcomes and I really invite everyone to please 
not leave right now when our awesome elected representatives leave, but to talk to our movement leaders, hear what's happening in our communities. It's incredible, yes, how much pain is out there and how much we need a solution to these interlocking crises, but also the vision that is out there that we hold, that we will make true for a future where we can all survive and thrive. So please join us over here around the corner and we'll be answering questions over here. Thank you so much, everyone. Alexandria. Thank you so much. Thank you so Great. much for doing this. Is there any way we could take a picture?